results. Okay, so we're going to uh, keep keep uh, typing in into the chat if you want to. Uh, if you have questions at any time, feel free to answer uh, to type those into the chat box. We may take them uh, when you ask them, or we may wait until the end. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna jump in to uh, to 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 start with this quotation here. So we've got this quotation: seventy five percent of careers are derailed for reasons related to emotional competencies including the inability to handle interpersonal problems, unsatisfactory team leadership during times of difficulty or conflict, or inability to adapt to change or elicit trust. Uh, that, that's a quotation from a study from the Center for Creative Leadership. And really, we, we just wanna tie this to what's actually going on in companies. Mm -hmm. What are those struggles? What are those challenges? And what are they related to? Uh, and, and as you can see, the, what we measure by the EQI uh, is really close to this idea of understanding what's going on here. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that, again, that we'll keep coming back to is that when people do the assessment and get their results, it gives them a really comprehensive picture of how they're functioning, how effective they are, um, some scores on, on their well-being. What it doesn't do is necessarily lead to development. It points to areas for development. But it's really when the, the tool is coupled with, uh, with coaching that you get really positive um, results. So mm -hmm. that's, that's the premise that we're working from is that the tool is very powerful. And we, we really amplify that when we add coaching to it. In terms of what we're going to talk about today, we're hoping to uh, to tell those of you who who don't know or who or who are unfamiliar what we mean by emotional intelligence, and then what we mean by the emotional quotient inventory. We'll look at that. Uh, we'll talk about what coaching is, uh, and and then we'll look at a couple of case studies, which we think are interesting. Mm -hmm. And and when we say case studies, uh, these these are actual. Uh, coaches that we've we've had people that we've worked with, and, and of course we want to protect their confidentiality and uh, and their anonymity, and and so we've changed around a few things, but but really it's to to tell you, and this of course it's after the fact. We have this after the fact benefit. It's not like we're looking at some results that uh, for a person that we've never met before, but really just to say that context is really critical and important. Mm -hmm. We we can't really say anything just by looking at a set of EQI results on their own without actually checking it out and having the conversation or the debrief with the client. In terms of emotional intelligence, uh, we've got these wonderful brains which, uh, which do uh, many things, uh, one of which is to be intelligent, that is to use logic and reason. And, and of course, that's, that's one part of the brain. Another part of the brain processes emotions and emotional information, but it does it at the same time. So we're always looking through an emotional lens. We're always having this, these emotional responses going on in the background. And so we really need to understand that better in order to understand um, these, these uh, what, what the Center for Creative uh, Leadership, will, will we have access to the recording? Yes, you'll have access to the recording, absolutely. Uh, and we've also got the PowerPoint slides for you too. So we'll, we're, we're happy to make those available. Uh, but in terms of, uh, of the brain, helps us to understand things like relationships and things like communication and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and really critically important for organizations is understanding how leaders are either effective or less effective. Mm -hmm. uh, so and there's ideas about emotions that some emotions are hard or we should avoid emotions or set them aside. And I think part of what this is conveying is that that's actually uh, physiologically impossible. And so I think a lot of humans spend a lot of time trying to put emotions aside or only feel the quote unquote positive emotions. And what we hope people get in this work is that emotions are information or data and it, they're, we can neutralize them to some extent and be more curious about them rather than judging them for their um, degree of you know, outcome, I suppose, uh, how they make us feel. So we're really encouraging people to see in the same way as we use the logic or cognitive part of our brain, that we use the emotional part of our brain to feed us more information so we're more effective. Uh, we all know that when we don't pay attention to our, to our emotions, 
they have a way <laughs> of speaking loudly and getting in the way and sometimes really derailing our effectiveness and our, our capacity for relationships mm. and impact. So, so given that we human beings are emotional creatures, um, how, how are we going to then be intelligent about emotions? And that's where Reuven Barr owns work and, uh, and the wonderful work of, of MHS comes in. Um, Barr own. Is, is the volume, um, can we just check volume? Somebody's saying it's oh. low, we're not sure if it's us. Oh, uh, we, can, we, can, we can lean into the microphone a bit more. Is that, is that better if we do that? Okay. Yeah, so it's good. It's good. Okay. okay, sorry. Okay, we'll try to we'll try to just talk. We'll just I, Okay, so some people feel so. Okay. Okay, thanks. All right, we'll we'll speak up <laughs> and uh, and bring the microphone closer. We'll get a little closer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so so what I'm showing you on the screen right now is the model that was uh, that was based on the original work of Dr. Reuven Bar Own uh, and uh, published by MHS, uh, a Canadian company. Uh, and what we see in this model is that the center we see the concept of emotional intelligence, the fact that we are emotional social creatures. Then it's about the competencies. Uh, what are the skills or what, what are we going to actually do in order to be more intelligent about emotions? Uh, and here we've got the, the 15 discrete EQ competencies, which we're going to look at when we look at EQI scores, because this is the basis for the emotional quotient inventory, an online assessment, 133 statements. You answer that using a Likert uh, type scale. Uh, and then you get a highly detailed report. And we're just going to look at some snippets uh, of those reports today. Uh, but the, you can see that the competencies fall into five categories, how you perceive yourself, how you express yourself, how you connect with others, how you make decisions, and how you deal with and manage the stress that comes with uh, modern life. Mm -hmm. Anything that you want to add? No. Jill? I, again, I think, you know, when we push out to the outside ring, um, what we, what I think any of us who are coaches, that's really what we're coaching to is how to be effective, how to have a sense of well being, how to be both emotional and social in our connections and, and function well, um, in a, in a satisfying way to us. And so it's, it's really what we're pushing out to is that outer ring. And that's why the emotional intelligence, this tool in particular lays underneath coaching or is foundational to coaching in so many ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I really like the, the way, the way Jill says this, she talks about the, the idea that while with the EQI, we're trying to get, uh, trying to understand your baseline in terms of where you're operating in general with these things, but we can always dial them up mm -hmm. or dial them down depending on the situation. Mm -hmm. So sometimes uh, we need to dial up our assertiveness. If we're going to be going into a meeting mm -hmm. and we're going to be asking for uh, for a pay raise or something like that, as an example. Um, and, and other times we're going to dial up our empathy when we're dealing with someone who's struggling with something. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, I, I th what's interesting, and, and we will, maybe we can look at one of the pages now, but um, people were well trained to, in our education system to think that high scores are always better. And what we really want to convey to people is that we don't want to always be operating all of these 15 competencies at their highest level because it would just be noise it would not be a harmonious balance of competencies so what we want to have people know is that they can turn that volume up and down but it becomes much more of a conscious choice and again one of those links to coaching which is making intentional or conscious choices about what skills are required and, and how, how you show up in that um, environment and and interaction which is a great segue to talking about coaching. <laughs> yeah, because we're trying here to, first of all, create a culture of trust, respect, creativity, innovation, um, inspiration. So that's, you know, when I go to, into a coaching session, I'm thinking about all of these things. People need to trust me, and that means I need to be authentic and show up in my, as myself, but also show up in the interest of my coach, a coachy client. Um, and we want people to feel empowered by it. So how do we feel empowered? We gain competencies, we gain insight, and the, the EQI gives us both of those. Um, what, sometimes people have more specific ideas about this, developing their skills and enhancing their leadership abilities. And sometimes they wanna focus more on personal problems and the EQI sheds light on both sides of that, both personal and professional functioning. 
Great. Great job, Jill. Thank you. Uh, and, and um, you know, taking the EQI certification course, which is a course that we offer where you learn how to use the EQI, does not make you a coach. However, um, if you can, uh, you know, I either take coach training before or after taking the certification course, it's just going to make you that much more effective in terms of how to follow on once you've you know, debriefed someone's EQI results with them. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and once you've, um, uh, you know, help them to understand what their results might mean for them, then to be able to follow on with coaching is a, is a fantastic and great way to go. And it's, it's really much of the work that we do. Yeah, I think lots of people, and I, we would echo that, that the EQI really gets to the heart of the matter very quickly. And uh, because it's a personal inventory, people have told us about how they're functioning in, that con in the context of their current environment and circumstances. And so we're really building from that inventory. People are saying, here's how I'm doing. And we're saying, how do you want to be doing? Where do we want to move that um, score to? So it's a really good picture of how how people are doing at that time. And it gets to it more quickly than, than a coaching process without the, the EQI. Absolutely. Yeah, so... so, so oh. Somebody's asking a question. If there's time, can you please share the different EQ toolkits available? What are the differences? Um, we won't do that today, but... Um, well, this is, we can comment on it yeah, a bit, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Let's, uh, let's talk about Maggie. Right. This okay, I'm like, just... Um, re oh. Also... A couple of clients after taking the EQI realized they needed focus on competencies in their personal lives more than, yeah, business yeah. relationships. And that's, yeah, yeah people have different um, perspectives on that. Sometimes people will say, well, I was thinking about who I am at work more than at home. And we're, you know, there's a kind of, I guess, some, some old conventions that we are different at work than we are at home. And, and what we encourage people to do is to really merge those. So authenticity really means you are who you are and you perform differently and you interact differently, yeah. but you don't um, separate so much. And so that's always a curiosity for me in coaching is how do you do that? How do you like not be the same person at work and, and home? Um, but, and you're, you're right in this way too, that it sheds sometimes more light on their personal, how they're functioning in their kind of their broader life rather than just their business life. So yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the EQI asks you to think about yourself in general. Mm -hmm. uh, although some people, because of the context that it's being taken in, which is frequently a leadership course or a program right. of some kind, they think that it's just about work. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they then they will differentiate when they when they see some sentences in the EQI and that something personal will come up for them and they'll answer that way. But in the debrief, those things come mm -hmm. out. And then it's mm -hmm. an opportunity to talk about, okay, so you're you're quite different at home. Uh, uh, then, then work. What, what's what's that all about? And would you like to be more of whatever in mm -hmm. in the workplace? Mm -hmm. Let's let's go. Let's look at Maggie. Okay. So Maggie is a young uh, leader who's been sort of identified as a high potential candidate and has been given lots of development opportunities. Um, and so this is her score. So the first thing we look at is. Um, is, are her scores in these 15 competency or skill areas in balance with each other? So I can't conclude anything without knowing her, but I can start to see what's in and out of balance. So I see, for example, that her self-regard is a little bit lower, her assertiveness is a little bit lower, and her social responsibility is a little bit lower than some of her higher scores. The, the gold bar in this case represents the leadership a leadership bar and so that's an area that we hope leaders um, kind of aspire to and can can get to so we see her strengths and that's really the first place I want to go is where is she really um, certain about her skills and makes use of them in an effective way and that's clearly in the area of stress management that she's flexible she she handles stress and she brings a sense of optimism or resilience to to the way that she probably works and, and lives in life. Where, where I'd be starting to be curious is how her um, self-regard is not as connected to some of her high skills. And that's a curiosity and it often shows up in the women's leadership courses. Um, and I think even more broadly than the women, women's courses where self-regard 
is is lower than the way that people are performing or functioning in life and so that's often a very tender spot for people and um they it's like their their own test of themselves and the way they feel about themselves remember this is about the the emotional part of this skill the way they feel about themselves isn't influenced by their um, capacities and the way that they're being acknowledged socially. Yeah, and we, we hypothesize that Maggie is in a, a tech environment. Mm -hmm. She's uh, she's younger, and so yeah. she's really she's really uh, interested in her career. She's interested in um, in you know what that looks like down the road. Mm -hmm. She's a high achiever, and mm -hmm. some of those things. And enter she's into used to being well. successful. So one of the things that's interesting, and we I see it a lot in in younger women, is that the social responsibility score is low. And it would be tempting to have some, maybe um, draw some conclusions about that. But my sense is that social responsibility takes a back seat when, when women are really busy. It's, these are the busy years for women. They're building a career, they have a family, they're pulled in lots of directions. And that social responsibility is not always front and center for them because of um, just the realities of time. So again, a lower self-regard and a lower social um, responsibility are the areas that I'd want to know more about. But actually, what's interesting here is that that high stress tolerance, even though this is an example of where a high score isn't necessarily serving her, she's ha she handles stress so well that she's actually not being attentive enough to how she's doing. And it's being a bit of a barrier to um, recognizing that she's struggling a little bit. She's in a tech environment. And it's actually quite hard on her. She feels always like she has to do double the work to get half the recognition. And so that's actually um, what came out in the conversation was um, this high stress tolerance and high optimism has kind of shielded her from looking at how the, the impact that it's had on her personally. So that's the kind of richness that I think this tool offers is it opens up that conversation quite quickly. Um, Another area that we might look at, but maybe not this balance between self and community, um, where her self-regard is low and her social responsibility is, is quite low. But I might also just hear her say, I just don't have bandwidth. I used to do volunteer work or I plan to in the future. And, you know, it's so again, the two, this is a, um, a conversation where, where people decide whether that low score is serving them well enough for now and that we don't really need to focus on it. So on the low side, low doesn't necessarily mean we got to set some development goals around it. It might just mean oh, it's okay for now. That's, it's working. Mm -hmm. And this lo this low assertiveness is really just problematic if she's not able to ask for uh, a better arrangement. Yeah. So how yeah. to yeah. structure yeah. things in a better way for herself. Yeah. So. Yeah, and I think you know again this combination of being young having like her self-regard is really taken a hit because she does feel like she's not recognized for her skills because she's in a kind of a very male dominated environment. And so being assertive, um, she's very aware from a gender perspective that being assertive can often put her in a box of something that's uncomplimentary rather than seeing her as, um, you know, being able to take a stand for herself or her clients. So she's walking this very tight line in this hierarchical environment, gender based environment. And I've, I've also heard you say before, Jill, <laughs> that you your observation, and you've heard it from women as well, uh, that 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 self regard score could be reflecting uh, this idea that that society projects onto women that they can have it all. Right. They can have this mm -hmm. great career and this great family, and and and, and the reality mm -hmm. is that they're they're just not meeting the their own targets for right. all those different yeah. areas of their own yeah. life. Yeah, thanks for reminding me of that. I think it's a really important um, part is that we set standards for women that are actually unachievable, and so women always feel like they're never enough, never doing enough, never contributing enough. You know, they're the ones that have to leave to go home to their children, pick up kids from daycare. Remember those days when they used to leave the <laughs> office and go get our kids from daycare? Um, and so, yeah, it's it really takes a toll on women's self-regard, which I think just, I'll just say one more thing about self-regard, mm -hmm. and that is that we think of self-regard as a self um, concept, but actually it's so developed in the social context. Uh, we only know ourselves through those interactions. And so 
you can see for Maggie that relative to other skills, it's taking its toll in this environment for her. Let's talk about uh, Randy. Uh, and so, so Randy is a guy that, that I worked with. He was um, uh, sort of near the end of his career. He was kind of unsure of his role. He kind of got bounced around a bit. They kind of, the organization didn't really kind of know what to do with him in, uh, in his uh, last, uh, last few, few years of working. Uh, when we look at his EQI, we can see that, that his scores are, are very similar. Uh, and uh, they're, they're kind of around uh, the, the mean uh, or just below, um, they are not within the gold bar range that that uh, that where where we want leaders to aspire, um, uh, and and so I guess what I would say about Randy in terms of his strengths are that he's got sort of well balanced scores. He's got some higher scores in social responsibility and 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 flexibility, and really it's that flexibility that, that's kept him hanging in there, mm -hmm. willing to go with where the organization wanted to send him and where they wanted mm -hmm. to put him, even though it put him out. It meant a longer commute. It, it meant the, some inconveniences, mm -hmm. and he was he was willing to to do that. And and he's a he's a loyal um, uh, employee, uh, and uh, and very adaptable. Now, in terms of some. Uh, of the potential blind spots for Randy, uh, he's got he's got this low low-ish independent score and this uh, uh, this this lower emotional self-awareness, a bit lower op optimism and interpersonal relationships and and so if we try to understand that uh, from Randy's perspective again, he's uh, he'll do what the organization tells him to do. So mm -hmm. that low independence means you can pretty much. Uh, mm -hmm. Put Randy anywhere, and and, uh, and they did, and they they it, it was like they were taking a bit of, of advantage of him, mm -hmm. um, and um, that low emotional self awareness meant that he wasn't all that um, uh, in touch with that inconvenience mm -hmm. or or recognizing or understanding that um, that that little bit lower optimism um, caused him to to try to just sort of fly under the radar to just keep a low profile until and 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 exit the organization and, and look forward to retirement and interpersonal relationships. He didn't have that much invested yeah. a anymore yeah. at that point. So in terms of coaching uh, with Randy, we, we really zeroed in on and focused on his well-being, his self-regard, feeling like if he felt like he was actually working towards some more meaning and purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, and what that meant for Randy was uh, talking about what his legacy, what he wanted his legacy to be mm -hmm. in that organization. Mm -hmm. So we talked about focusing on some of those interpersonal relationships. And, uh, and we talked about, um, uh, talked about how he could shift his uh, his outlook uh, with respect to optimism. Uh, and in so doing, uh, he could increase his self-actualization and his sense of self-regard and well-being by feeling like he was actually mentoring and developing other leaders and working uh, towards that uh, in, his, in his final time with that organization. Let's, let's move on and talk about Carrie. Right, so she's in transition from a public sector to private sector. Um, and was really enjoying that process. Um, and at the same time, <laughs> uh, one of the things that we look for, because we said earlier that EQI is contact sensitive. So if there are interestingly, um, kind of interesting fluctuations or variations in these 15 competencies, I sometimes wonder whether people are in a transition and that transition can be moving into a relationship, a more serious relationship, having children, going through loss, making a job change, uh, pandemic. So uh, we're, we, I always wanna ask people two things. One is, is this score representative of you? So we get some validation there, but also what's been going on, any, any significant changes that might, uh, might be um, impacting your current scoring. And so this for sure, Carrie, in transition, has had some effects and sometimes you'll just hear it in what they say that like they'll they might say you know two years ago when i was doing this um, that score would have been different and so that's always very helpful information and what people are saying is that the context does influence uh, eqi and eqi influences the situation so that's another area that sometimes i'm looking at when i'm coaching so we might be concerned here about some high scores being overused. And that's 
you know, when I'm reviewing the scores, I see like, wow, emotional self-awareness and emotional expression, those are your sweet spots. And people really like they shine when they can see that their things that they value are scored high. And then I'm a, kind of a bit of a downer because I say, so how's it not serving you? Like, where are some areas where that might not be serving you? And of course, this emotional expression, awareness and expression, when it's not coupled with strengths like um, independence or assertiveness or impulse control can get her, get us into lots of trouble, um, in particular, low impulse control. If we have high expression and low impulse control, she may be predisposed to saying more without a lot of thinking behind it. Um, and that is really a, a potential blind spot and a potential derailer for her effectiveness at work. So while we appreciate these high scores of awareness, emotional awareness and expression and her empathy, which is lovely and super important as we know in leadership today, and that sense of optimism about being able to bounce back, which she's going to need in this um, new environment, the blind spots really are also some of her high scores. And then in addition to that, this reality testing, like not being able to really check out her impact and having some implicit biases that she's not really brought to the surface yet. And so I think as a coach, that's part of my job is to, to help her name some of those biases. Like she has a bias towards emotions and emotional expression. And so she's not necessarily uh, connected as much to some of the private sector values and goals. So we need to really examine um, how she can still show up authentically, but, but also fit her, know more about her biases and beliefs and fit them more into the new cultures that she's stepping into. And that, um, I think the reality testing is really important in terms of being aware of the impact that she's having. Um, also empathy, we talk about that from an impact. That's a, a because she has high empathy, I would use that to help her develop um, more knowledge about how she's affecting people around her. Impulse control in the report is always seen as a, as a, a potential leadership derailer. And um, as I said earlier, especially combined with emotional self-awareness and emotional expression, um, the US recently um, <laughs> removed a leader who had very high emotional expression and very low impulse control. And, and very, not, very low emotional self-awareness. Right. So I'm not suggesting Carrie is that, but you know, in the extreme, that's what we get are, are people speaking without thinking and without connection to the impact that they're having. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, so here again, I'd be um, both building on that reality testing as well as building particular skills around independence and assertiveness, uh, because the more she feels like she can actually speak her truth in a way that's um, methodical and thoughtful and is connected both to the external to the organization as well as to her emotions, the, the less anxiety she's going to have about just speaking quickly and mm -hmm. without thought. So it's about kind of calming some of that, some of her system down and getting her more connected to the impact that she's having, really. Yeah, there was an earlier question, and thank you, Vanessa, for that question about when you have when you have someone who's got high scores in all categories. Uh, this is where we zero in and try to look and see whether there are some that are being overused or that the yeah. that that uh, the impact is a potential uh, downside for someone that it's that it's not serving them well. One of the metaphors that we use as a, as a music soundboard. If we pushed all those levers, the volume and the bass, fill in, fill in the blanks here, Dave, but like that all, you know, there's a lot of levers on a music soundboard. If we just push them all to their highest volume, we would not get beautiful music. We would just get like screeching noise. And so we're always curious about what happens when people are functioning at that high level all the time. Mm -hmm. What's the impact on them? What's the impact on others? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you found the high scores don't always track with what they value the most. Right. Yeah. 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 And certainly as a coach and using this tool, I'm always looking for the values that are underlining it and, mm -hmm. and where they're being ignored or overused or um, yeah. Uh, Self-actualization is the place where we really look at values because that's about meaning and purpose, but they're throughout all of these 
Um, so some people value a relationship more than they value optimism, for example. Um, and so, so we're looking for that as well and the values underneath each of these. Yeah. All right, let's talk about Cali. So Cali has a stable government job that she loves, children leaving, adult children leaving home. Uh, and here are some of her strengths in self-actualization, emotional self-awareness, empathy, social responsibility, flexibility. Um, and, and she she came to us as someone who you knows in the right job, likes what they do, caring, shows up for people, strong desire to be a good teammate and and a, and a loyal employee. But then you can see for yourselves uh, on the screen there, there's a couple of lower scores. These are not low scores. They're just below the mean of 100. Uh, standard deviation is 15. So we're really looking at scores between 85 and 115 as being where most people score and not necessarily on their own problematic. That's why we have to look at the whole picture mm -hmm. and try to understand the whole picture. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where we, um, I uh, get into some potential blind spots. Do you want to talk about those, Jill? Sure. I, again, here's that low self-regard, and and she says for herself, she's her own worst critic, and and I would say that's probably not true. <laughs> that there are a lot of critics in the world, and and we all absorb we all absorb that, and then and so much so that it begins to sound like our own voice, um, like I'm too fat, I'm getting wrinkles. Like those are not. We don't make those things up. Those are voices from from our social world. So um, yeah, so own worst critic is um, maybe self, but it's obviously the opportunity for coaching is in that statement. I'm my own worst critic. So I, I and we've spent a lot of time looking there. What does that mean? What is her own voice? Where does she, how can she get a hold of her own voice? What's true for her? What's the dominant discourse? Um, <laughs> there, I uh -oh. <laughs> we have working from home yeah, <laughs> construction barking and barking dogs and yes oh and we're probably about to hear some noise in the background with the with the um, fireplace being installed so <laughs> we're going to show some flexibility here <laughs> uh, yeah so so I'm very curious about self-regard um, and looking at what's her voice and what are other people's voices so um, sorry I'm yes, I'll, I'll okay go. You, you carry on. <laughs> yeah, so, so self-regard is an area that I think anchors all of the report and all of the EQI competencies. So we're really, it's very important to me that people get a sense of, of how self-regard is affecting each of these competencies and affecting their quality of life. So that's really important that we look there. Also, um, lots of times women talk about how their high empathy score is both their best quality and um, the thing that gets in the way the most, especially if it's out of balance with assertiveness, where women are more prepared, or people, but I, I mostly do the women's leadership program here, uh, where people are more prepared to take a stand on behalf of others. So you can see this high empathy and high social responsibility. So she's very willing to speak on behalf of others and her sort of a score and in independence actually quite like pretty strong, um, but less willing to speak on behalf of themselves to say what's okay and not okay for them. What's most interesting is this low stress tolerance and low optimism. So when I got really curious about that, what, what came to came to the front is that she's feeling really, really sad that her kids are leaving home and that she's going to be an empty nester and um, somehow she, she hadn't been able to get her head around that. And she was just feeling in a really low place right then and not feeling a lot of energy to bounce back from it. It's COVID, kids were going out in the world where it's not that safe. And she just wasn't handling things as well as she used to. And so again, that opened up a lot of uh, space in the coaching part of our relationship to talk about that. Okay, moving right along. Oh. Uh, we didn't do the, the, the coaching focus, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Per permission to look after self. Yeah, yeah. And, and you can see how important that is as she's, um, you know, mourning the, the change in her family circumstances, that um, her next step is to really strengthen herself and build out on what is uh, available to her as she goes forward in a, in a relationship with her partner and, um, yeah, without the kids so close. 
Okay, so, um, uh, so this is Bell Hooks, and, and she's written some really powerful, impactful books, uh, and commenting from a sociological perspective. And, and she wrote this, which is just so powerful and just such a, uh, such a hard-hitting kind of statement. She said, the first act of violence that patriarchy demands of males is not violence towards women, Instead, patriarchy demands of all males that they engage in acts of psychic self-mutilation, that they kill off the emotional parts of themselves. <laughs> and, uh, and wow, uh, I mean, uh, uh, th this, if you, if you think it's an extreme statement, just think about what we tell boys about emotions, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Big boys don't cry. So we learned very, at a very young age. Um, uh, to disregard and and deny and avoid emotion and mock like we and mock, mock boys yeah, with, with yeah. emotions we humiliate boys with yeah, emotions yeah. Um, and so we're going to look at a report now that we thought it was a great quote to introduce oh yeah. by the way our our next webinar is on toxic masculinity yeah. and so we're going to really get into this this whole uh, gender socialization idea and and, uh, and its effect uh, on uh, on men so, but uh, but first, we're going to take a look at this guy, Jared. Which which is the effect on men, yes, right? That's yeah. why we are yes. wanting to look here. And what David and I were thinking yeah. about when we looked at it is sometimes, you know, you can look at emotional self-awareness and emotional expression, see how low they are. And we can kind of socially, the social construct is, yeah, that's a guy. And I think it's really time to not be doing that anymore. We think it's really, we need to be taking the these, like, huge defects in men's socialization seriously mm -hmm. and and see what's possible in development yeah yeah you know that that quotation comes from willing to change and, and it's really all about how the patriarchy has affected men in very limiting and uh and alienating ways and 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 it's about uh it's about inviting men to come to the table to and and to, it's a wonderful metaphor of bell hooks uh, talking about coming to the table of love uh, and uh, and really it's about getting past all of the the masculine macho uh, bs that that society puts forth and and challenging those traditional beliefs and so when i met jared and we looked at his emotional self-awareness score he he just really was at a loss with respect to emotions he said you know aren't there aren't there just two emotions angry and happy uh, and and he was S serious and joking at the same time because mm -hmm. joking because because that's what that's what we men do about things that we're uncomfortable with we make jokes about it so we make jokes about uh, about having no emotions or about being emotionless uh, and and isn't that kind of bizarre that we're making jokes about not having a critical and important part of, mm -hmm. of us which makes us effective as human beings mm -hmm. uh, and that we disregard that in certain situations and settings mm -hmm. uh, and and so so this is about this this is about a a, a, a sort of a shift in beliefs mm -hmm. I was going to say a change in beliefs but but it's hard to change beliefs yeah. So we're trying to get Jared to understand more about emotions and how emotions affect his behavior. Can you do it? Go forward. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. So yes. So so Jared has some real strengths: uh, self-regard, independence, interpersonal relationships, and uh, and what we know about his interpersonal relationships is that those are less characterized by emotional depth and more characterized by you know, um, being, uh, as, as males do, uh, being close friends, like loyal and committed and, you know, I'd be, I drop everything to be there for you, that kind of, uh, of, uh, of relationship. Um, but they don't, they don't share at a deep level necessarily. That's not part of, of, of that relationship. And the empathy related to the interpersonal relationships, the empathy, empathy score is an interesting one mm -hmm. because it, it tells us that he's not necessarily paying en enough attention to the impact he's having in his relationship. So he thinks that they're high quality and his self-regard is high. So that might be partly what's telling him that <laughs> the relationships are, are quality relationships, but without empathy and social responsibility, he's not necessarily getting feedback on it, on the impact he's having. So he's kind of working in his own, bubble there and yes. low reality testing as well he's not really checking out how he's showing up and what the effects are and so we would probably ask him 
to do some work around getting feedback and information about the impact he's having on people. Mm -hmm. And obviously, emotion, potential blind spots are things like emotional self-awareness and some of those low scores. But where, where problem solving is raised as an issue, even though it's a high score for him, mm -hmm. uh, that low emotional self-awareness tells us that he really disregards his emotions in problem solving. Mm -hmm. So maybe he doesn't struggle enough with those problems that have big stakes, where those ones that you really need to wrestle over, he's not wrestling with them. He's just going straight through, not recognizing right. perhaps the magnitude of the impact on others. Right. Again, that word impact. And I yes. think that's a really, like, generally speaking, mm -hmm. it's an important word in the EQI, but I think in particular for men, um, that they're not taught to pay attention to or know about how they're affecting or what, what impact they're having. And certainly that's true in leadership in general, that that's such an important skill. And that's why empathy is such an important skill is that, that, that leaders are expected to know the impact they're having on their teams and their leaders and their organization. So the question, thank you, Adrian. <laughs> uh, are there indicators of sociopathic tendencies? No, uh, the, the EQI was not designed to diagnose or, or detect uh, psychopathology. So, uh, I mean, it is possible that someone is, uh, has sociopathic tendencies, but to look at an EQI score and, and say that that, that, that is uh, a possibility mm -hmm. is a long shot and, and it's not our professional background or training. Mm -hmm. So, so we're coaches, uh, not, not counselors uh, or psychotherapists. And if you're working as a coach and you, you're working with someone who really does not get the, get or understand the importance of impact, you, you may be outside your scope here, right? You, you, yeah. may, you ha may have yeah. to realize your professional limitations yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and refer somebody. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about Tina. Yeah, so we, we brought Tina here because um, sometimes it's so disheartening for me when I see a low, low score like this for anyone. And um, I just, in this case, I'm not so interested in going through the scoring as I am about just a, a really um, connected conversation about what's going on in your workplace. So she does have some strengths with emotional expression, a little, you know, strong enough on soft regard, um, some decent relationships, but here I might be more inclined to set the EQI aside and think more about how she's doing and what's happening for her and have a more process oriented conversation. I don't think that these low scores are gonna help her really at this point. What I am gonna say to her very strongly is that these results are about context and not about her. So it's not about um, what's wrong with her, it's about what's happening in your context. So really try and um, in every way possible to lift these scores out of being absorbed personally by her as failing, because uh, that's the last thing she needs right now. So this one feels like I'm being very heart oriented in, in my approach with her. Um, yeah, I think this idea like that she's, a, she's showing up as kind of confident, like in her relationships and her, her expression, but in this case, more than any other ones that we've looked at, I want to know what's going on under the surface because I think she's paddling like mad underneath the, the water. And sure enough, there's a lot going on for her. And so this is not going to be the most useful direction to go. We might reference it once in a while. Um, and I might ask her things like, what would it be like if you could bring that self-actualization score up by 10 or 15? Like, what would that offer you? Where, what else might open up for you? So we might look a little bit at some of that, but only if I'm, if I can really hold the optimism and hope for her. So, and then the other side of that is really looking at the impact of her workplace culture. And this might be um, really about, is this a fit for you? And what are the impacts that it's having on you? What are you afraid of here? Like they're all living in fear of being being let go. Uh, the, str the stress and the workload is inordinate. There's not a lot of alignment with her values and, and the workplace that she's mm -hmm. in. So I'm gonna be looking at all of that and kind of in the back of my mind, I've got the EQI results, but in the forefront is a conversation really. 
Uh, and someone says, uh, Anthea, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, how much time should elapse? Uh, and, uh, you know, in, it, it really varies, you know, what's, what's happening with, uh, with uh, Tina? Is she engaged in coaching the whole time? Uh, how does she want it? Does she want to retake the EQI? And, and, uh, uh, and, and, and of course, we, we caution against yeah. wanting to sort yeah. of look for improvements because um, improvement takes time. And, uh, you know, you don't want to do it too quickly, or people are going to try to remember what they said before that sort of thing. So, so six to nine months is kind of like a minimum. Uh, and, you know, longer is better. Uh, g give it a year, see, yeah. see how things yeah. are at, at that time. Yeah, and really, mostly people think they might want to take it again. And those are those high achievers that are already <laughs> like they have too low scores, and they want to see if they can bring them up. Um, you know, it's not a competition here. <laughs> so I think I, I would feel like there was a risk here with Tina. If nothing so substantive changed, as in getting out of this work environment and into a different work environment that was more aligned for her, I'd be worried that it would just reinforce these low scores. And I think often, as those of you who do coaching or development work, you, you will know and she will know. And so you can informally look at some of these over time, like where are we at now with social responsibility or where are we at now with, with stress tolerance and kind of think about setting up, like what does it look like to move this by 10? What would we need to do? And it's more about that. So we've done that. Great. Now, now what? What's next for us? Mm -hmm. where, where, where else are we going to make the biggest difference? Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of it turns to coaching rather than reassessment. Yeah, and the question around before and after uh, coaching uh, for for efficacy, Adrian, uh, the answer is that it's possible, uh, and and we've 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 mm -hmm. seen it done, and we and we we've, we've used it that way. Just it's just not with the expectation that everything goes up, right? Because in some cases, oh, people yeah. may in fact want to right size their scores, mm -hmm. meaning that they might want to dial down their assertiveness, bring mm -hmm. up their uh, their empathy. Uh, or, mm -hmm. or even dial down their independence in order to become more collaborative. So, so we, we, we just have to have that understanding. Uh, uh, and, and then certainly you, you could uh, do a, a before and after mm -hmm. or a, at various intervals. Yeah, it makes me think as you're saying that, that you'd want to set some goals with with mm -hmm. your client, yeah. but what are we going to look for here? Right. Yeah. As we, as we frequently say, the goal is not to get a higher score yeah. in the EQI. The goal yeah. is to be a more effective leader, yeah. more effective partner, more yeah. effective friend, parent. Well, uh, th those are the, uh, are sort of um, reasonable goals, yeah. but not to yeah. get a higher score on the EQI. All right. So, so um, uh, at that point, we just wanted to share this, this quick quotation uh, here uh, from Dr. Lauren Hallian. Uh, and, and we've uh, talked a lot about yeah. low self-regard and the social context in which self-regard mm -hmm. emerges and is developed and is known to us. Um, and a lot of that, some women often say, I feel like I have imposter syndrome. And if we think back to the first young woman, she's doing really well, but she's not feeling good about herself. Um, she might talk about that in kind of imposter syndrome ways. Um, but this, this quote says, do you actually have imposter syndrome? Or is it just that you spent much of your life having your knowledge and skills subtly dismissed and devalued? And I think that's the question, right? Mm -hmm. that, we, that we can't look at self-regard as if it's an independent variable. It's part of, um, well, first of all, it's part of 15 competencies, all of which feed and balance with each other. But more importantly, it's a social construct. And so we need to look at who's, who's um, building her sense of herself and who's dismantling her sense of herself? Where is she known to herself through others? And what does she know about herself through others? So those are more the conversations that I want to have around self-regard. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. And, and, and that's uh, something that you talk about a lot in the women's leadership course, the heart and science of leadership for women, that is. And so we'd love to take your questions at this point for our remaining time together. Uh, and um, we're just taking a look at the chat box. So feel free to type your questions into the chat box. Uh, a refresher. She, yeah. Okay. 
What additional approaches and resources? Well, uh, Dana, uh, as you know, you can always come back and retake the the EQI certification course, resit the recert the EQI cert recertification course. Um, that we offer that as a refresher at a very low price for for uh, alumni of ours, uh, and uh, so that's that's one way. Uh, another is if you've not used up your follow-up coaching, which we offer to all of our, mm-hmm. our alumni, then, then feel free to get back in touch with your coach and, uh, and, and uh, talk about whatever you want to talk about, to, whether that's a brush up uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the, the skills. Also, we have our peer debrief practice sessions. So you just yes. get in touch with Crystal and you're paired up with somebody else who wants to do a practice debrief. So you exchange reports and each of you gets a chance to do a debrief. So that's another opportunity and that's free and available as many times as you want to use it. Yes. Um, Yeah. So, so someone's asking about the online certification experience uh, and, uh, and the practitioner training, which, which we offer uh, every, 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 oh, sorry. Yeah. So about Tina, um, would I suggest homework? Yeah, I would suggest homework for her. I, I, um, I inevitably do ask for homework. I think most of us do as coaches. But what I'd be looking for is um, toxicity. I'd be asking her to look for where, what relationships feel toxic to her, what, what in the culture feels most toxic for her. I, wanted, I want her to build um, a new picture of her environment and see how much it's impacting her. So that might be one of the first steps that I take. But, you know, these homework things kind of come in context of the conversation. But absolutely, I think that's, that's going to be most useful for her. Yes. And, and so uh, in terms of do we provide practitioner training each month, we have an online certification course uh, and, uh, and, and we, uh, we certify you to use the EQI, which if we've not mentioned it, is the world's leading tool for emotional intelligence. It's been reviewed by the, the Burroughs Mental Measurements Yearbook, and uh, it is the most researched and scientifically validated. It was the first scientifically validated mm-hmm. tool for emotional intelligence in the world as well. Uh, it'll be recorded. You'll all get a link to the recording, so don't worry if you, if you missed some of it. Uh, and... Um, uh, particularly interested in using it in relation to women and leadership. Uh, excellent. Uh, and uh, yes, cert- certificate, both certification courses are amazing. Yeah. And by both certification courses, we have one called developing EQ with the prerequisite is, is our certification course. So if you come take our certification course to be certified to use the EQI and the EQ 360, then you can come and take developing EQ, uh, which is a, a course all zeroed in on and focused on how to develop in the 15 competencies measured by the EQI. Um, want to offer it after speaking engagements? Yeah, Janet, you can certainly come and get certified in order to, to uh, add that. Thank you for all your, your wonderful supportive comments to everybody. Uh, there's a lot of our alumni on the call uh, and that's wonderful. And, yeah, sorry to skip uh, and for the, the, the new folks. Yeah, even if you certified with someone else, you can take our developing EQ course. Um, um, yeah, we're, yeah, the um, <laughs> hope there's more coach training. We're really, we're designing a program right now for yes. using this tool in coaching. And um, thanks for the kind of nudge around that. Yes, um, yes. For alumni and, and, and others uh, certified in Dubai. Nice. Uh, cool. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so if you have any other questions at any time following our time together, we're going to wrap up. We still have a few minutes left. If you have any questions, please uh, send those in. Uh, and if we run out of time, you can uh, you can always oh, MBTI. That's um, a good question. Can always follow up with us afterwards. Um, uh, MBTI uh, oh, Myers Briggs Type Indicator is a uh, is a a personality type Put indicator, uh, and so uh, so it measures different things. So that's why it would be it, it is an excellent pairing. We say the EQI pairs well with everything uh, because it's really unique uh, in how it measures uh, EQ competencies. And so absolutely, it works well with personality type indicators of all kinds and types, like Myers Briggs type indicator, uh, like um, uh, Insights uh, or whichever one you're you're choosing to use. Yeah, Disc. Disc, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, any other questions at all that anybody has there? Be happy to take a look at those. I'm just going to check the Q&A box just in case, but I, I don't see anything on the Q&A. So. Great. 
Uh, all right, so. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today and oh. thanks for all your questions. Great. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, we decided to go with the samples, the, you know, the review of some reports yes. because both of us early on, you know, you kind of pour over the, um, the questions that are provided in the report, the coach report and kind of do all this preparation. And then you realize you're with a human being who has a story and that that part is really the important part. Yes. They, they were the ones that answered all the questions about the, the uh, responded to all the items in, in the um, EQI inventory. And so you really have to be engaged with the person in order for this to be effective and, and work. So, yeah. Yeah, Dane is asking about our Wednesday morning session. So Wednesday mornings, we uh, the alumni are invited to get together, uh, and uh, and and we ask a check-in question of some kind, send people into breakout groups to talk with their peers, uh, and it, and it's always related to emotional intelligence and the EQI in some way. So it might be a current event that we talk about. We've talked a lot this year about. Uh, anti-black racism, uh, toxic masculinity, uh, other kinds of uh, challenging mm -hmm. topics, and uh, and people have really leaned into those. Yeah, sometimes we talk about EQI and bal balances and imbalances. Sometimes we ask um, a powerful question, a coaching question, and um, yeah, it's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and uh, and of course, for those of you who aren't interested in certification, um, you can. Uh, we're very interested in talking about offering an event uh, of some sort for your organization, whether it's an online workshop or uh, or EQI assessment and and coach training. Uh, Paul is asking, where do I sign up for Wednesday AM sessions? You 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 should get the the email a reminder weekly, Paula. Uh, and if you don't, we'll we'll look into that. Send me an email message personally, and I'll I'll make sure that you're on that list. Uh, and uh, Corey squared, <laughs> thanks, Vanessa. <laughs> thanks. So so great to have all of you with us uh, uh, today, uh, and thanks for for being here. And we're going to it's the top of the hour. We're going to sign off and say please join us for our next a session June 4th on toxic masculinity. That's going to be an interesting session. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. Bye for now.